Okay, so it's like um, back to the future again. Uh, January 28, I think it was 2016, uh, you were on my first edition, and I have to apologize. I, was, I didn't have a crystal ball, you know, everybody calls me right now, yeah, by the event, all the journalists, and they say, okay, who is the future Revolut? And I have to be honest, in 2016, uh, 16, I didn't knew he would success like that, so he was on a secondary stage, I done somewhere, uh, um, and uh, I'm so sad I didn't saw that, but at least I invited you. And you came and you always came back uh, many times, I'm so happy, so uh, I have plenty of questions, it's the last of the day, so I won't keep the timing, I tell you. Uh, only thing he has a flight, so perhaps one time I will stop. Uh, first part of my question will be about Revolut. Tell us a bit more, today, what is Revolut? How many markets, how many clients? Uh, sure. So we we will launch 2015. So it's year five, uh, and then we are more and more uh, moving into the direction of being a financial super up, effectively one up, providing uh, you with financial services for everything what you need, uh, ten times better and ten, ten times cheaper compared to banks. So we're now about 11 million clients, uh, growing 20 to 40 thousand uh, new accounts every day. So we we'll also have uh, a very large uh, business customer base. So we have more than 350,000 businesses using us. Again, growing 1,000 to 1,500 a day. Uh, but the concept is very simple, right? We want to provide you financial services for your everyday usage, either for free or at a fraction of cost compared to other financial services players out there. I will ask you a bit more info on that because honestly, it's not always easy. We all, all, everybody knows your brand, but many people remind only the Revolut card just for FX. Okay, this was the launching stuff, but uh, to my understanding, and I'm using your service, so I know you have much more services today. So you are present in many countries, for example, in France, Germany, UK. What what can we do else than just good FX rate? Yeah, so we, I mean, there are like in you know, a good parallels with Amazon, which we started in. Uh, 1999 with uh, selling books online. So we were the same in 2015. We started with uh, selling effects uh, uh, for free, right? So you could effectively spend with our card and avoid the uh, effects uh, fees that banks charged. Uh, at later stages, we expanded into free money transfers, free international money transfers, cheapest insurance, uh, cryptocurrency, now commission free trading. So we are launching a wealth management solution. Again, some of it will be for free. Uh, so we do tons of things, you know, for people. And uh, yeah, there are you know several more products that we are launching uh, this year. So you you say a lot the word free, but some of your products are not free because you need to earn some money sometimes. So um, can you tell us a bit about the paying product? Are they successful? Sometimes do you change the pricing or, or go back? I mean. You have a bit of feedback now on this pay product. Yes, yeah, so pay, pay pro, our, our business strategy is very simple, right? So uh, revenue lines, uh, we make money from interchange whenever a customer pays uh, with a card. So we make money on subscription business, uh, same model as Spotify or Amazon Prime. A uh, portion of people convert to premium metal cards, and that's a significant portion, by the way. Uh, then we have our user fees, so people who go above a certain limit, uh, we charge them. Uh, and then the fourth revenue stream is a business account uh, stream, which again grows very fast. So we are quite well diversified across you know, many, many products compared to standalone digital banks who just you know, rely on interchange. Uh, coming back to this uh, business account, uh, uh Everybody, is, since two years, I think, is saying, let's go to this business account, there is money. Um, everybody knows it's not so easy. Are you happy with the rate, growth rate of this business account in all the geographies you are? I mean, do you see the same traction for these kind of accounts? Yes, across the whole Europe, right? Obviously, initially we launched in the UK, then we launched uh, Western Europe, then Eastern Europe. Uh, it is a very useful product for, for businesses. It's growing 20% uh, a year. It's extremely highly... Uh, marginal product uh, so as a business as a start own business it's uh, it's a great business so um question because we speak of money when will you be profitable so we should target uh, this year to become profitable 
this year even keeping into account the money you spend to grow. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, so uh, next time you come, uh, you can... Uh, every single customer is profitable. Uh, we have a number of countries which are profitable already. And if we would stop marketing expansion and uh, new ventures, we call it, or new bets, then you know, the whole company would be profitable. Uh, if we go back to the models, um, many of your competitors, when they launch at the same time as you, because most of the neo banks, whatever you call them, were launched around 2015, uh, uh, you have two approaches. One was the marketplace, where you own the card and you plug so many other fintech services, and the other one was let's do everything by ourselves. You took the second one. So, can you tell us about, a bit more about this strategy? I wouldn't say we kind of you know chosen either marketplace or do everything ourselves. We like you know at every particular moment of time at every particular product we we, we chosen at this point of time what made sense back then, right? So sometimes we build our own, sometimes we partnered, sometimes we partnered and then build our own. It all dependent on uh, okay far, how fast we can release a product, uh, how fast can we monetize. If we partner, you know, what, what portion of the value chain uh, a partner is taking, right? And whether it makes sense for us to actually compete for this portion of the value chain. So uh, I would say we're a mix of all. So it's all opportunistic. It depends exactly, what is yes. the best for the company at the time. For example, you exactly. just launched uh, a trading on US stock. It's with a partner. Uh, trading majority of it is done in house. So partner where we're using is more like you know for clearing and then for licensing purposing. Again, you know to uh, speedy launch. Okay, so it will be always depending on the value chain when you can do yeah. or efficiency of launch. Yeah. Can we speak a bit about your US dreams? So where do you stand on US launch? Uh, so US, we are still in uh, our beta testing. So we have uh, thirty thousand uh, uh, active customers in the US. Uh, using the product daily. So we have one last issue to fix that, uh, which is effectively a speedy uh, top up of the account. Because you know in ACH, uh, ACH is quite an uh, old system. So whenever people send money through ACH, uh, money arrives within you know, two to three working days. So in Europe and in the UK, you have uh, well almost instant uh, well settlement. In the, in the US, you don't have it. So we, we are solving this problem. Uh, and then I hope within the next two months, we're going to solve it and I'll fully launch US. So you launch when you are ready? Yes, exactly. We, we just don't want to launch half baked product because the uh, US is a competitive market, right? And then we want to launch a uh, product which is top. So we speak about, okay, that was a nice uh, presentation about Revolut, but I'm more interested about the entrepreneur. Uh, uh, when we met. So we started a bit at the same time and you came, uh, you were, again, I think at this time you, lo you raised one million or, or two million and no, I don't even remember how much money you raised until now it's what? Uh, it was one and a half probably million, yes. So a bit, of, a bit more. Um, can you tell us about your personal path from day one to today? I mean, the hard time, but also the good ones, a few, the doubts perhaps, if you have any sometime. Well, the most uh, interesting fact would be I probably made uh, the most number of mistakes <laughs> over these uh, last four years compared to every other in entrepreneur in, in, in the last four years. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the key thing is to kind of you know have thick skin and you know learn from mistakes. So, could you elaborate a bit about some things you could have done differently or some good memories because you don't have only bad memories, I'm sure. So an entrepreneur in this last big five years? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, obviously, like, you know, mo most common mistakes, as uh, all uh, starting entrepreneurs do, uh, hiring not the right people, uh, or, like, you know, going in the wrong directions, and then, you know, changing. I mean, we, we tried so many things, right? Uh, and then uh, the reason why we are where we are is uh, because we were able to change and then again, 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 repeat things. Yeah. Um, where do you see yourself in five years and yourself and, of course, Revolut because it's like two phases of the same coin? Well, I, I enjoy doing what I do, right? I, I, I want to continue uh, building products, uh, continue adding value to users, uh, and then as a result of it, I want you know, the company to continue building products, releasing new products, and then expanding into new markets, serving uh, as, as many customers as possible. So is it, as an entrepreneur, when you fix a target to your team, 
do you say as many or do you say in five years I want this number of customer? Do you know what is this number? No, I say in three months I want this. Please deliver. <laughs> five years is too long. Okay. Exactly. So you, you, you can't tell me you want uh, 100 million customer in three or 10 years. It perhaps is in three months or something. Yeah, we just have, okay, this is a yearly target, but like in three months you need to deliver. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Five years is too long for a delivery. Uh, being the CEO of the leading fintech, what do you think of the recent acquisition uh, of Played by Visa? I mean, um, Zach was there on the same seat last year. It's a great thing. Five billion, do you think? Any, any opinion on that? I think it's a good deal for Visa, right? We will definitely see kind of larger uh, well, ecosystems. So like in case of Visa and Mastercard, because they're effectively duopoly, right? They're trying to enter in new, um, in new spaces similar to their space. <coughs> and uh, I can see them you know, doing it successfully, right? If you look at uh, uh, Mastercard, for example, they've done you know, a couple of acquisitions in the UK, obviously played, you know, done, done by Visa. So I think you know schemes are well positioned uh, in the future because they're actually doing acquisitions. So, sorry to go back to a really intimate question, but um, do you have a price? Because Zach, when he built Played five years ago, we didn't want to sell Azure, but perhaps one day five billion, he said, okay, let's sell. Do you have a price in mind, even if you don't say the number, or you just want to continue as far as you can go? I just want to continue as far as I can go. Loves entrepreneurs. Three months. So the thing is, <laughs> you are under camera. Because I just remember my, uh, my friend Jacob saying the same thing just six months before, before being bought by PayPal. So just keeping in mind, I will see. Um, how do you see fintech's future in general? Because you are quite everywhere, you do a lot of things in fintech industry. Are we only at the beginning or is, is the trend of about all this fintech buzz about to fade away? I think it's just beginning. I think uh, I definitely see large and larger conversion uh, between uh, us and the uh, banks. Speed of development, uh, even like you know things like you know compliance, risk, uh, governance, right? Which obviously you know startups uh, never looked at. It was all about product. But as as we matured as a company, as we started investing a lot of resources, as we put like you know product people, uh, data scientists, engineers in. Uh, traditional banking uh, sectors or areas such as compliance, risk, fraud, we realized that we can innovate there as well. As a result, actually our infrastructure became uh, even more uh, stable uh, and uh, less risky compared to banks. So I do think, you know, uh, fintech becomes better and better, but uh, banks, they, they just stay the same. So I think in the future, in five to 10 years time, uh, majority of smaller banks, they will not be able to compete uh, in the retail sector. I think larger banks will stay uh, because they have you know, a huge corporate business. And I think in the future there will be three to five uh, largest fintech uh, players who are global and who are focused on you know, retail clients. You almost already answered to my next question, but I still ask it. I mean, do you think in your industry, like banking and retail or, or, or corporate, it's like a winner takes all? Uh, or you can have space because today, if I look at all the fintech we have here, I need two or three phones to put all the apps on the screen. So, uh, at the end of the day, can we continue to have that, or it's more winner takes all in, in each vertical? I think in the next five to ten years, uh, we'll see consolidation to probably five players. In ten to twenty years, I don't know. Maybe there will be one or two huge players. But I do think you know market is so huge, and there are so many products out there. So it's very hard to see fast consolidation. Right? So in, in five to ten years, I do think that there will be you know many many big players, say five. You speak globally. I mean globally, yes. Okay. And do you think you st you will still have space for like local smaller players in some niche market like? Um, the French one, the German one, we are 27 countries, so we have new banks in all the countries, so. Well, in banking, I do think there is economy of scale, right? And then the more money you have, the more people you hire, the better products uh, you build, uh, the cheaper pricing you can make. So it's hard for local players to compete, given uh, less access to funding, less access to talent, or less customer base. So, I. Uh, I, I don't think in five to ten years time we will see many niche players. And um, 
come back to other things you bring to the market is one offer for several countries. I mean, we don't have today in Europe, for example, a big incumbent offering the same product in 27 countries. You almost offer the same product in 20, more than 27 countries. In, in, in 35, 34. 24. 34, but, yeah. And it's almost the same. I think you have a few adjustments in a few countries, but but majority of your product is the same everywhere, is it? Uh, well, actually, in UK we have uh, the largest number of products because uh, the way we develop products, we first test uh, products in UK, and then the UK is actually have the most developed uh, regulation and ecosystem uh, out of Europe, so it's easier to launch products in UK, uh, test them, and then slowly roll it out uh, across Europe. And given that uh, legislation in Europe uh, across you know, many countries is still not synchronized properly, so it's harder to uh, do it on scale across Europe. You need to go country by country. But, uh, so we always start from UK. But, but still, uh, your product is quite harmonized across the 24 countries if you put UK aside. It's still quite mm -hmm. the same. My, qu yeah. my question is, this is not really classical in finance industry. I mean, you go to big banks, you don't have the same offer, in, even for the same bank in France, Germany, and, and Spain. Do you think with time, you will need to do differentiating offers in different countries to please your customers? Or you want to stick to this one financial world offer? We do already have department doing, we call it a globalization department, global plus local, right? So it's effectively a department who looks for local features, implements specifically local features for on the country level uh, that this particular country needs and looks whether this feature can be scalable uh, across other countries. Um, so we, we, we do look at it at the moment. So we, we do localize on, on the country level. So up will be a bit different in every single country, dependent on uh, on well on uh, what users need in this particular country. And there are you know certain specifics, like for example in the US, uh, it's very uh, uh, well cash heavy still our economy, and then uh, people actually like uh, ATMs you know much more compared to Europe. As a result, we put for them uh, specific for US product uh, ATM map, and then you know we roll it out for for other countries. Uh, in the UK, it's possible to link uh, other bank accounts um, to Revolut app. So right now, for example, the version of Revolut app I have displays all my bank accounts in one, including uh, HSBC, for example, and Lloyd's. And then I can see budgeting analytics across all my accounts. I can, you know, move money between my accounts, uh, including Revolut, instantly. Um, so it's it's very country specific. Thank you. Uh, you don't seem too afraid by the bank reaction to Revolut, so you don't seem to see them as big competition, if I understood well. Uh, but do you think the big techs could be a new competition, perhaps harder for you, like when they really begin to go in financial industry? Uh, I do think that they can. Uh, I do think that if they move it full speed into financial services, they will need to uh, become regulated. And they don't really want it because it's uh, it's a separate huge area which can significantly affect their main business. So if you have a business which brings you 200 billion dollars in revenue a year, right, and then you make a bet on a new business which will potentially bring you 10 billion dollars a year, but then you know with certain probability this 200 billion will be 100 billion, right? So you will think twice before actually uh, applying for banking licenses. You're right, but some of them are already doing stuff. I mean, Google working with Citi, uh, Apple working with JP Morgan, mm -hmm. uh, uh, all the big giant tech in China doing payments and so on. So don't you think they could really more compete you because they are quite innovative and they have the money and so on? Uh, well, it's very hard to innovate uh, sitting on top of banking infrastructure without owning it, right? So if you partner with Citi or with Goldman or with JP Morgan, you still don't own bank infrastructure, you still can't innovate on the bank infrastructure. And then uh, as a result of it, you can't release products that you want because it will be blocked by uh, banking risk committees or compliance committees. So it will be harder to do things without uh, actually own, owning the full stack. And could we imagine one day that uh, Revolut is enabling such partner? You could be the partner of Google instead of Citi, or 
maybe one day, but so far white labeling business was not that attractive because you effectively uh, take all uh, compliance risks without having enough margin on, uh, on transactional business. So you don't close the door, but that's not a strategy for now. No. And last question, because we run out of time and you have a, a train to catch, where if you have three key challenge for the next year or perhaps three months because a year is too long, so three key challenge, what, uh, what are they for Revolut in the next three months? Well, key challenge was always the same. It, it didn't really change with the years. Like obstacles change, problems change, but like key key thing is always about uh, hiring right teams, hiring right people, uh, and making sure you have uh, my direct reports are you know strong people, and then their direct reports are strong people, and direct reports of direct reports are strong people, and building the whole uh, company structure uh, full of for uh, A players. So that that there is a challenge, and then it will always be a challenge. Thank you very much. You can applaud this entrepreneur. Thank you.